Therapy of Spiritual Illnesses, An Introduction to the Ascetic Tradition of the Orthodox Church, Volume 1, by Dr. Jean-Claude Larcher, translated from the fourth French edition by Father Killian Sprechter, published by Alexander Press, Montreal, 2012, originally published in France in 2000. Publisher's Introduction. As the publisher of Alexander Press, it gives me great joy to offer to English readers for the first time the complete masterwork of Dr. Jean-Claude Larcher, Therapy of Spiritual Illnesses, translated from the fourth French edition by Father Killian Sprechter. A vast synthesis of patristic and ascetic oriental teachings from the first to the 14th centuries, Therapy of Spiritual Illnesses presents a renewed vision of the Christian doctrine of salvation and constitutes a veritable treaty, both theoretical and practical, of spiritual psychology and medicine, as well as a summation of orthodox spirituality that has had no equivalent until now. Dr. Larche is an orthodox patrologist and theologian, born 1949 in the east of France. He holds doctorates in humanities, theology, and philosophy, studies the relevance of understanding and foresight of the patristic fathers, to questions of health, sickness, and healing today. He is an emeritus professor of philosophy in Strasbourg and is one of the foremost scholars of St. Maximus the Confessor. Dr. Larche is the author of many widely acclaimed works on the theology and spirituality of the fathers, including the companion volumes to the present work, Mental Disorders and Spiritual Healing, 2005 Sophia Perennis Press, and the Theology of Illness, 2002, St. Vladimir's Seminary Press. His works have been translated into 12 languages, English, German, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, Greek, Romanian, Serbian, Russian, Bulgarian, Arabic, and Korean. The fourth edition was originally published in Paris in 2000 and has also been translated into Greek by Apostoliki Diakonina. Signed, Dr. Jean Haji Nikolai, Pentecost, 2012. Author's Introduction The goal of Christianity is man's deification. God became man that man might become God. Such is the formula by which the fathers throughout the centuries have often summarized the meaning of the words incarnation. Uniting in his divine person, the divine nature without confusion or division to that of man, Christ has brought the latter back to its original state, thus appearing as the new Adam. Moreover, he has brought it to the perfection for which it was destined, the perfect likeness of God, the participation in the divine nature. He has also granted the possibility of becoming God by grace to those who should unite themselves to Christ by the Spirit and the Church, which is his body. In the economy of the Holy Trinity, which aims at the deification of man, and in him, the union of all creatures to God, the specifically redemptive work of Christ, which in particular lies in his passion, death, and resurrection, constitutes an essential moment, namely, that of our salvation. By means of this work, the God-man, Theanthropos, freed human nature from the tyranny of the devil and the demons. He destroyed the power of sin and conquered death, thus abolishing all the barriers that from the first act of sin onward had separated man from God and had prevented man from being completely united to him. As Vladimir Lossky wrote notes, Western theological thinking has interpreted this redemptive work of Christ in essentially legalistic terms. One certainly finds the basic the basis for understanding redemption in terms of a ransom in Holy Scripture, particularly in the epistles of St. Paul. But this must not lead us to forget, as Lossky points out, that, quote, in the fathers generally, as well as in the Scriptures, we find many images expressing the mystery of our salvation accomplished by Christ. Thus, in the Gospel, the Good Shepherd is the bucolic image of the work of Christ. The strong man overcome by the stronger than he who taketh away his arms and destroys his power is a military image, which is often found again in the fathers and in the liturgy. 
Christ victorious over Satan, trampling upon the gates of hell, making the cross his standard of triumph. There is also a medical image, that of a sickly nature cured by salvation as the antidote to a poison. There is an image which could be termed diplomatic, the divine stratagem, which deceives the devil in his cunning. End quote. To be sure, the image used most often, taken by St. Paul from the Old Testament, is borrowed from the sphere of judicial relations. But taken in this sense, redemptive, redemption is a juridical image of Christ's work found side by side with many other images. And quote, when we use the word redemption as a generic term designating the saving work of Christ in all its fullness, we should not forget that this juridical expression has the character of an image or simile. Christ is the redeemer in the same sense that he is the warrior victorious over death, the perfect sacrificer, etc. End of quote. To continue, the exclusive use of the image of ransom and too strict an understanding of it quickly manifests the insufficiencies of this image and even results in the theological absurdities, as St. Gregory of Nazarene particularly stressed. One of our goals in this work is to highlight the importance of the medical image, as Vladimir Lossky calls it, in the Orthodox tradition. If, as we shall see, the fathers made such frequent use of this image in their teachings, if one finds this image in nearly all the liturgical texts used in the Orthodox Church as well as in the texts for the rites of most sacraments, if several councils confirmed it in their, in their canons, in short, if it has been received by the entire tradition, it is because of this image constitutes, as we shall show, a particularly adequate means of representing how our salvation was manifested, having at least as an importance equal to that of ransom. Furthermore, the medical image possesses a particularly solid scriptural foundation. The Redeemer is also the Savior. If we have been ransomed, then also are we saved. Indeed, it is often forgotten that the verb to save, used frequently in the New Testament, not only means to deliver or pull from danger, but also to heal and that the word salvation indicates not only deliverance, but also healing. The very name of Jesus means God saves. In other words, then heals. And Christ presents himself quite directly as a physician. The prophets also often proclaim him, and the evangelists characterize him in similar manner. Even the gospel parable of the Good Samaritan can rightly be considered as a representation of Christ the physician. Finally, many of Christ's contemporaries in his earthly life came to him as to a physician. Since the first century, the fathers have almost unanimously accorded him the title of physician, often adding such quantifiers as great, celestial, and supreme. They also sp specify according to context of bodies, of souls, and more frequently of bodies and souls, emphasizing that he came to heal the whole man. This name appears at the very heart of the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom and in the majority of sacramental formulations. One finds it in almost all the Orthodox Church's liturgical services and in a good number of prayer settings. If Christ appears as a physician and the salvation he brings appears as healing, it is because humanity is ill. Beholding mankind's healthfulness in the primordial state of Adam, the fathers and all of tradition see the state of sin which characterizes fallen mankind after the original sin as a state of manifold illness affecting man in his whole being. This notion of mankind as sick from sin finds scriptural support, which the fathers did not fail to use. In the example of the prophets, the fathers call to mind the inability of the men of the old covenant to find a remedy for their ailments, however serious these were, and their calling to God throughout the generations. God's favorable response to this call was the incarnation of the Word, who alone could effect the awaited healing because he was God. The saving work of the God-man thus appears in its various moments as a twofold process. 
First, of the healing in Christ's person of the entirety of our humanity, which he assumed, and second, the restoration of humanity to the state of spiritual health that it originally knew. Moreover, Christ leads human nature thus restored to the perfection of deification. This salvation healing of all humanity and humanity's deification in the incarnate person of the Word of God, the Logos, are given by the Holy Spirit to every baptized person who unites himself in the church to Christ. But these gifts are only potential. The baptized person must assimilate this gift into his entire being. Herein lies the role of the spiritual life of asceticism. The term asceticism in the Orthodox Church does not have the narrow sense that has often been given to it in the West. Rather, the word points to what every Christian must accomplish in order to benefit effectively from the salvation wrought by Christ. From the point of view of the great tradition of the Orthodox Church, the work of salvation appears as a cooperation between divine grace bestowed by the Holy Spirit and the effort each baptized person must make personally in order to be open to this grace and take hold of it. One makes this effort throughout one's life, at every moment and in every act of existence. Besides this, the Greek word askasis means exercise, training, and way of life. In addition, the corresponding Russian words podvig, etc., derive from the Slavonic verb meaning to move or to go forward translate an eminently dynamic conception of spiritual life. These words make it clear that the spiritual life is conceived of as a process of growth, namely that, that of gradual actualization of the grace received in the sacraments, and particularly in baptism. Likewise, the process is that of the progressive assimilation of the grace of the Holy Spirit that effectively incorporates the baptized into the dead and resurrected Christ. Such grace allows man to acquire for himself the human nature that is restored and deified in the person of the God-man. Through theanthropic asceticism and by the grace of the Holy Spirit, the Christian dies, is resurrected and glorified with Christ. He ceases to be fallen man and becomes a new man. He casts off the old man and puts on Christ. He realizes the exchange of fallen nature for that which is restored and deified in Christ and which baptism potentially affected in him. Since tradition considers the salvation wrought by Christ as a healing of sick human nature and the restoration of the latter's original health, it is logical that asceticism, by which man gains grace for himself, also be considered as a process of man's healing and his return to health. We found it striking when reading the Fathers to note that they all make very frequent use of medical categories in describing the various forms of asceticism. They do this so often that it seemed to us that asceticism could be systematically presented as a perfectly elaborated therapy. Furthermore, asceticism is itself defined for the same reason as is medicine as an art in the ancient sense of technique and even as the art of art and the science of sciences, following the proverbial expression. Patristic teachings also present asceticism by using the categories of battle and combat, which have this meaning in addition to that of effort and training, and often appear as equivalents for ascases. But without reducing the former categories to the latter, we can observe that they are complementary, since medicine has as its goal the fight against the cause of illness, the battle against illnesses and their defeat, owing to the implementation and utilization of a therapeutic strategy and arsenal, etc. Certain contemporary commentators often take the expression of the forms of man's salvation in terms of therapy and healing to be a simple image. This is true in some cases, but in many others one must speak of a symbol founded on the natural analogy that exists between bodily or mental ailments and spiritual ones. We intend to show that the medical categories being used are directly applied to their object and are revealed to be perfectly adequate to its very nature. 
Fallen human nature is in truth spiritually ill, and Christ accomplishes a true healing of this illness by the Spirit through the sacramental life and asceticism. Of course, one must admit some difficulties. Fallen man does not have a spontaneous awareness of his spiritual state. Because his illnesses are spiritual, they are not as apparent as his bodily or even mental ailments. And it is at this level that this symbol plays an indispensable role. In this study, however, we intend to show that the Orthodox ascetic tradition presents a very detailed description of fallen man's sickly state. At the spiritual level where it is located, this description constitutes a true medical semenology, or even by reason of its systematic and coherent character, an authentic medical nosology. This appears especially in the classification and description of the passions, their nature, their causes, and their effects, which the fathers constantly and explicitly indicate as spiritual illnesses. The word for passion already bears in itself this connotation, being close to the word meaning illness. Such nosology is necessary for effectively envisioning the therapy and obtaining the healing that make up the goal of asceticism. We intend to show that the orthodox ascetic tradition presents this therapy in a completely systematic and methodological manner and shows it forth as a true spiritual medicine for the whole of man. Furthermore, we shall see that those who devote themselves to asceticism are usually distinguished as healers. First, they are healers of themselves. Then, when they have advanced on the path of asceticism and are sufficiently experienced, they are healers to those who come asking for help in healing their own diseases. That is why spiritual fathers are generally called physicians in the patristic texts. Meanwhile, if the definition of spiritual therapy presupposes a precise knowledge of illnesses and their causes, this knowledge itself demands that one have a precise idea about what man's health is, since the notion of illness makes sense only in conjunction with this. Although therapy aims at reestablishing or acquiring health, it also assumes that such health is clearly defined. This is why we shall begin by presenting the patristic conception of man's health, a conception that will guide us throughout our study. The notion of human health held by orthodox anthropology is inseparable from that of the ideal human nature possessed by the original Adam. Before being led astray, this nature was a synergy of Adam's free will and of divine grace unto his perfection, that is, deification. That is to say, human nature has a direction found in its different components. It is naturally oriented toward God and is destined to find fulfillment in him. We shall show how, according to orthodox ascetical anthropology, man is in a healthy, healthful state when he achieves his destiny and when his faculties exert themselves in accordance with this natural aim. We shall also show how sin, thought of as separation from being with God, establishes in man a manifold state of illness by turning him away from his essential goal. This sickly state is notably characterized by the perverse usage, contrary to nature, of all man's faculties. One will see from this, how th theanthropic asceticism, by which man is ontologically converted, constitutes a true therapy, in that such asceticism permits man to turn away from this pathological and unnatural state and to recover the health of his original nature by turning toward God. Part 1. Anthropological Premises Original Health and the origin of illnesses. Chapter 1. Man's Original Health The fathers associate man's health with the state of perfection intended for him by nature. For mankind, perfection means deification, and it is within man's nature to become God by grace. Indeed, God created man 
in his image and likeness, and from the beginning gave man the possibility of being completely like him by inscribing this in man's very being. He conveys this to us through the psalmist. I say, ye are gods. Man in his creature is a creature that has received the commandment to become God, affirms St. Basil the Great. St. Gregory Nazazine writes similarly, When the immortal Son created man, he gave man the aim of himself becoming God. Man already possessed a certain perfection at his creation. First of all, this was a perfection of his spiritual faculties, in particular of his noose, an imitation of God's, and capable of making his creator known to him, of his free will, created in the image of God's will and enabling him to direct his whole being toward him, and of all his desirous and loving powers, traits of divine compassion reproduced in him which allow him to be united to God. On the one hand, the perfection of these faculties results from being created by God in the image of his own faculties. On the other hand, this perfection arises from their being what enables man to be completely assimilated to God. On condition that these faculties not turn away from God merely because they are free, but rather that they open themselves up permanently and totally to his grace. The relative perfection man possessed at his creation did not solely consist in his capacity to unite himself to God, which his faculties conferred upon him. Adam was created already realizing to some degree the likeness of God, and his task was to achieve its completion. From the beginning, he was turned toward God, and in his very nature, created in the image of God, possessed all the virtues. St. Gregory of Nyssa writes, quote, Man was created in the image of God, which amounts to saying God has made human nature a participant in every good. Thus, all sorts of good are in us. All virtue, all wisdom, and the best things one can imagine. End quote. St. Dorotheus of Gaza teaches in the same vein. God made man in his image, that is to say, clad with every virtue. And St. John of Damascus, God made man adorned with every virtue and rich in every good. St. Maximus likewise notes, the virtues are inherent in the soul from creation. Thus, man is virtuous by nature. St. Dorotheus of Gaza explains, by nature do we possess the virtues which are given to us by God. God placed them in man when he created him. Virtue is naturally in the soul, notes St. Isaac the Syrian. The virtues are natural to man, writes St. John of Damascus in similar fashion. The Holy Fathers particularly emphasize the fact that the virtues are inherent in man's very nature, not additional qualities somehow or other given to him in addition. Nevertheless, they have a dynamic conception of this subject. The virtues are not given to man completely fulfilled. They belong to his nature as a goal to be realized insofar as the virtues constitute the fulfillment and perfection of this nature. But their realization implies man's active participation in God's plan, the cooperation of all his faculties with the divine will, and the free opening up of his entire being to God's grace. Man was created with the potential to realize these virtues and was beginning to realize them. He possessed them as a seed, but it behooved him to cultivate them to fruition. In this sense, do the fathers understand the divine commandment given to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. This is why they say that in paradise, Man was very small, for he was an infant, and he had to come to adulthood by developing himself. In contrast with St. Gregory of Nyssa, most of the fathers distinguish between the image and likeness in order to show this dynamic character of the acquisition of virtues and of deification. According to this distinction, God's image in man determines the sum of possibilities for realizing the likeness, that is, the potentiality 
of the likeness of God. The likeness, however, is constituted by the image's fulfillment. It consists of the image's blossoming forth, consistent with its integral nature and resides in the realization of its perfection. Whereas the image is natural, the likeness is virtual. It is to be realized by man's free participation in God's deifying grace. Thus, St. Basil the Great explains, quote, Let us make man in our image and likeness. We possess one by creation. We acquire the other by will. In the first structure, it is given to us to be born in the image of God, being in the likeness of God, is formed in us by the will. Our nature possesses potentiality, potentially what belongs to the will, but we procure this for ourselves through action. If in creating us, the Lord has not taken precaution in advance to say, let us make an in the likeness, if he had not bestowed upon us the potential to become the likeness. We would not have acquired the likeness of God by our own might. But behold, he has created us potentially able to be like God. In giving us the potential to be like God, he has persuaded us to be the artisans of God's likeness, to the end that we received the due recompense of our labor, that we not be an inert objects, out of the artist's hand, and that the result of our likeness not turn to the praise of another. Indeed, when you see a portrait that conforms to the model exactly, you do not praise the portrait, but rather you admire the painter, and thus, so that I might be the object of admiration and not another, he has left it to my care to become God's likeness. Verily, I possess rational being by means of the image, and I become the likeness by becoming Christian. End quote. St. Gregory of Nazazine explains in a similar fashion man's necessary participation in the acquisition of the gift given him by God. He thus writes, quote, The soul shall possess the object of her hope as the prize of her virtue, and not only as a gift from God, It would be then in bringing goodness to its apogee that the good also becomes a property of ours, a good which is not only a seed entrusted to nature, but also the object of a cultivation dependent upon our will. The fathers who distinguish the image from the likeness connect the virtues with the latter and wish thereby to show that the virtues must be dynamically revealed and developed by man's active participation and constant collaboration with the Holy Trinity's deifying grace. However, we should not assimilate the distinction of image likeness to a distinction of nature supernature, in which the likeness would be the latter. Such supernature by God's grace would be added to a nature able to be thought of independently and which would constitute the image. Not only the image, but also the likeness is natural in man, according to the fathers. It is in man's very nature to be like God. It is in the image's very nature to achieve its perfection in the realization of the likeness. And man was created, let us repeat, already realizing this likeness, naturally, by virtue of the image. The likeness is not an addition to a nature able to exist independently of it but rather a development of the nature given in the image. Through God's image in him, man is naturally perfect, although in a virtual sense, and he is naturally endowed with the capacity of realizing this virtuality, of assimilating himself to God. Such is the normal goal of his existence, the normal destiny of his nature. Therein lies the sense of the divine commandments, be fruitful and multiply, Be holy as I am holy. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. One can thus say, in a dynamic sense, that man is naturally deiform. If the likeness of God was given potentially and began at once to be realized in the image, this implied that in order to be fulfilled in its perfection, Adam himself would wish to realize this wholly. 
as the fruit of the collaboration between human will and divine grace, the likeness could be nothing other than a theanthropic effort, the common realization of God and the man turned towards him. By very reason of the perfection wished for and inscribed in him by God within the divine image, man had complete freedom to unite himself to or to refuse to work with God in realizing God's plan. Meanwhile, God had given him a commandment to help him use his freedom well. This was made evident in his original nature's total perfection, in his true goal, such that this commandment would have been realized in permanently choosing God alone. Constantly upheld by his free will through this choice, Adam would have preserved himself in the good where he had been created and would have continued to possess it to an even greater degree. Adam prayed continually to God in this primordial state in which he was realizing his nature's true goal. He praised and glorified his creator ceaselessly in accordance with God's will, cultivating divine thoughts with his soul and being nourished by them. Adam lived permanently in the contemplation of God. Recognizing the presence of divine energies and creatures, he was raised up to the Creator by them, and in turn raised them up to God in himself, since he had been appointed as their king. Thus, he realized his function as an intermediary between God and matter, accomplishing the mission given him by God to unite the sensible world to the intelligible to reunite through love created nature with uncreated nature by making them appear in unity and identity. Beholding God continually in every being, Adam also beheld God in himself, since his soul's purity allowed him there to contemplate God as in a mirror. He was even able to enjoy the vision of God face to face. St. Athanasius of Alexandria writes, having nothing to prevent him from knowing the divine, his purity allowed him ceaselessly to contemplate the Father's image, the Word of God. In this state, Adam abode in God who abode in him. In addition, all the fathers present the first man to us as being an intimate on intimate terms with God. Likewise, the book of Genesis shows him to be to us speaking daily with God with all boldness in paradise. Surrounded by divine grace, Adam lived in a permanent state of intense spiritual delight. The fathers constantly evoke the sweetness, delight, joy, happiness, and bliss connected with his contemplation, his theoria. All these resulted from the close relationship with God which allowed Adam to to participate in the blessedness of divine life. Man thus lived his true life, says St. Athanasius of Alexandria, that is the life for, for which he was created and which constitutes his authentic nature's normal goal. Adam himself was unified and unified in himself all other beings through the perpetual contemplation of the one God in all things. This unity meant that there was no point of division, neither within man nor between man and those like him, nor between man and other beings, not yet among the other beings themselves. Peace reigned over all and in all. In paradise, man led a life without sadness, pain, or worry, possessing God's gifts and the dominion which belonged to him from the word of the Father. He lived a life without anxiety. He did not have to fear any internal illness. In his flesh was perfect health, in his soul, perfect serenity. Fever, impulse, irrational madness, and gluttony, none of these existed yet. Rather, life was for him without rebellion and existence without grief. Man in paradise had healthy and stable faculties in their natural state, and as long as he remained in the natural state in which he had been created, a state of permanent union with God, man possessed the integrity of these faculties. In days of yore, says St. Gregory of Nyssa, the human race, as one can imagine, enjoyed health because its elements, I mean the soul's impulses, were balanced in us according to the laws of virtue. 
The paradisical state in which man lived according to his primordial nature thus appears as a healthful one. In it, he knew of no form of illness, whether in body or soul, and led a completely normal life, since this was in keeping with his nature and its true end. By original sin, Adam turned from the path on which God had set him at his creation. Man missed the goal intended for him by his very nature. When Adam stopped directing his whole being toward God and opening all his faculties to God's uncreated grace, the mirror of his soul was darkened and ceased to reflect its creator. Since Adam stopped participating in the source of his perfection, the virtues within him became weak, and he lost the likeness of God which he had begun to realize from the moment of his creation. God's image remains in man and cannot be lost. But since it is no longer brightened by man's active union with God and no longer finds its fulfillment in the likeness's realization which constitutes its true aim, the image is altered and veiled. Whereas man's advancement toward perfection in the light of the Spirit made the image radiant, sin suddenly darkened it. Since then, man has forgotten what his authentic nature is. He is ignorant of his true destiny, no longer knowing what his real life is, and has lost almost every idea of what his original health was. Although humanity could have later recovered in some measure the sense of God, thanks to the inspired voices of the prophets, it attained but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities. Only by the incarnation of Christ is humanity fully restored to its original nature. Only by the incarnation does man fully recover the possibility of realizing the perfection for which the Creator destined him. Christ, who became perfect man without ceasing to be God, restores to human nature the fullness and entirety of its original perfection, brought to fulfillment by union with his divine nature in his person. Thus, God himself in the person of his Son immediately reveals to all and realizes humanity's ultimate destiny. This destiny is the perfection of the human nature intimately and completely united to God. Adam was only a type of the one who was to come because he failed in his ultimate destiny. Christ, however, manifests the fulfillment of the promise, the gateway to full perfection. The Savior alone is the first to have realized the authentic and perfect man, writes St. Nicholas Cabasilas. Being the image of the invisible God, the glory of God, and the very stamp of his nature, in which the fullness of divinity dwells bodily, he reveals the deep meaning of man's creation in the image and likeness of God. His divine nature is made manifest in his human nature, linked to it without confusion or division. He is the visible and fulfilled model of the new man, in whom fallen humanity is called to be renewed, whose image all men are invited to copy, and whose likeness all are invented, invited to acquire. He comes to affirm by his twofold theanthropic nature that man is meant to be a man-God. God became man that man might become God, proclaimed the fathers. In Christ, God presents himself to man as the model of man's perfection and destiny. He shows man by his example that his nature is both human and divine. God reveals to man that he is a perfect man only when united to God since in the person of Christ, the union with the divine nature renders the human one perfect, and that only by assimilating oneself to Christ can man realize in himself this theanthropic perfection. Man is only really man when he is God in Christ. Christ is called a second Adam, not in so far as he would bring man a nature and destiny other than those assigned to the first Adam, but rather inasmuch as he himself comes to accomplish what Adam failed to realize by his sin. The fathers affirm that Adam was created in the very image of the Logos, the Word of God, 
and that the very mystery of man's creation in the Logos' image is connected to the mystery of man's filial adoption by the Father in his Son. From the time of his creation, man has had but a single purpose and standard, to be like Christ, the standard of his nature's fulfillment, fully and clearly revealed in Christ's incarnation. Man is created as a logical, that is, a reasonable being, but more fundamentally, he is a Christological being, since the fathers understand this to signify conforming to the Logos, to the Word of God. And the fathers even go so far as to say that man was created not only in the image of the Logos as God, but also in the image of the Logos as incarnate, Christ God and man. They con continue that man has as his destiny from his creation to strive with all his being to assimilate himself actively in Christ. St. Nicholas Cabasilas thus notes, quote, Human nature was created with the new man in mind from the very beginning. Man's intellect, his soul, his noose, and desire are created for Christ. We have received the noose so as to know Christ, desire so that we might be attracted to him, and memory so as to bear him in us. And this all the more since he served as our creation's model. Indeed, it was not the old Adam who was the model for the new, but rather the new for the old. For us who recognize him as our forefather, the first Adam seems to be human nature's archetype. But for him who beholds all beings before they exist, the forefather is only an imitation of the new Adam in whose image he was created." End quote. St. Nicholas Cabasilas continues this point. Man is orientated towards Christ not only on account of our Lord's divinity, but also on account of the other nature, the human one, that he possesses. St. Gregory Palamas teaches in the same vein, the very fashioning of man created in the image of God was already from the beginning for Christ, so that man might comprehend in him at the proper time the archetype. Likewise, the commandment was given in paradise for this reason. Christ is thus professed to be the beginning and end of human nature from all eternity, and in human nature of every creature. St. Maximus the Confessor, who writes regarding the divine nature's union to the human one in the person of Christ, particularly affirms this. Quote, Behold the blessed end in view of which all things were constituted, Behold, the plan God conceived even before the creation of beings. To this end, God created the essences of beings. Thus, God's recapitulation in every creature is professed as the expression of God's providential action, as well as of the beings that benefit from it. The word, God in essence, was made man and became the herald of this divine will. He made evident the most infinite depths of the Father's love and made visible in him the end for which all creatures were made. Moreover, it is for Christ, in other words, for the Christological mystery, that time and its contents received in Christ their beginning and end. end quote. With respect to man himself, these affirmations are consistent with the sense of St. Paul's teaching. The Father chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. He destined us in love to be his sons through Jesus Christ. And those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Thus Christ will be all in all. In Christ's person, then, do the beginning and end of man's nature find complete expression and man's authentic being and real destiny are clearly evident. The image of God darkened in humanity by Adam's sin is made manifest again in him who is without sin, and with more radiance than Adam possessed before his fall. This is because God's image is revealed in Christ in its fulfilled perfection, completely actualized in the complete realization of God's likeness in man, which is brought about in his person, by the union of the divine nature to the human. God's image and likeness in man are manifested by man's very creator, 
the Word of God made flesh, himself the perfect image of the Father, such as he wished them to be from the beginning in their complete and definitive fulfillment. In Adam, only the prototype's image appeared. In Christ, the prototype himself is shown. In Christ's person, the prototype is united to the image, without confusion or division, and restores it and brings it to its perfection by this very union. St. Irenaeus writes regarding this striking manifestation of the image and likeness of this revelation of man-god in the God-man, quote, The truth of all this appeared when the word of God became man, making himself similar to man and man similar to himself, so that man might become precious in the Father's sight by his likeness to the Son. Indeed, in former times one spoke of man's having been made in God's image, But this was not evident, for the word was still invisible, he in whose image man was made. Moreover, for this reason, it was easy for the likeness to be lost. But when the word took on flesh, he confirmed both the one and the other. He made the image to appear in all its truth, himself becoming becoming it even even though it was his image, and he restored the stability of the likeness, making man exactly like the invisible Father, by means of the henceforth visible word. End of quote. Thus the archetype of man's true nature is revealed to man in Christ. The new model which man from his very creature and by his very nature is destined to fulfill. As St. Nicholas Cabasilas notes, Christ is the first and only one to have realized the perfect and authentic man in all relations and as regards behavior and life. Enlightening one's being, realizing one's potential, living in accordance with one's nature, but also living perfectly, all this is possible manifestly even now for man so as to be like Christ, to be assimilated to him and to become God in him. Only in union with Christ does man find the fullness of his being, his nature's wholeness and entirety the true, original, and ultimate meaning of his destiny, the perfection of his activity and his whole life. Only in Christ can man be himself, can he fully be man and fulfill his true nature in all its dimensions. As St. Maximus says, the Son returns nature to itself. And St. Gregory Nazazin, by Christ is our nature's wholeness restored. Since by nature... In his origin and in the structure of his being and purpose, man is a Christological and theocentric being. He only becomes truly man by turning to God. Only by uniting himself completely to Christ can he become a true man, following St. Gregory of Nyssa's expression, and shall we say a normal man, that is, man generally speaking, and be in total health. Assimilation to Christ that is the health and perfection of the soul, writes St. Gregory Palamas. Outside Christ, man is neither really nor fully man. He is outside his own nature. He lives with part of himself lost and remains in a state of alienation, as we shall show below. Man is made whole and perfect. Man is shown to be adequate to his authentic nature only by becoming God through adoption as a son in Christ. For man possesses a perfect human nature only through union to the divine nature, which is found fulfilled in Christ's person and which each man can realize through assimilation to Christ's person. Let us repeat. Man is by nature theanthropic. If he is not a man-god in the likeness of the god-man, he is not a man at all. Man defined by himself, independently of his relation to God that is inscribed in his very nature, is a non-human being. There is no such thing as pure human nature. Man is man-God, or else he does not exist. Holy Scripture and tradition also frequently compare the state of the man who has not yet conformed himself to Christ who has not yet fully actualized the possibilities of his nature by manifesting God's likeness to an infantile state. 
the gradual union to Christ is defined as a state of growth, and the fulfillment of this union in its perfection is compared to a mature state, also called the state of grown or perfect man. St. Paul thus evokes the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that, he adds, we may no longer be children, rather speaking the truth in love, we are able to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. And he advises, be courageous. St. Simon the New Theologian writes in the same vein, using the same image, that he who advances on the path of union to Christ pursues his spiritual growth each day, removing every trace of immaturity and advancing towards man's absolute perfection. This is why, according to the measure of his spiritual age, he sees his faculties and the workings of his soul change and increase in maturity, adulthood, and strength. Thus man is called to become perfect in the image and likeness of Christ, in him and through him be perfect, and in this manner to become a partaker of divine life. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Roman 8, 29. For us, writes Clement of Alexandria, Christ is the flawless image. With all our strength, we must strive to make our image like unto him. And St. Irenaeus, by imitating his actions and keeping his commandments, we have communion with him. And by that, we who are newly created receive growth from him who is perfect from before all creation and are like unto him who alone is good and excellent. As for St. Isaac the Syrian, he notes that our fathers never ceased to welcome wholly into themselves the life of our Savior, Jesus Christ, so as to attain to perfection and the likeness of God. By practicing the virtues, man acquires Christ's likeness. As we have seen, man possesses from his creation and within his very nature all the virtues constituting God's image in him. But these are given to him only as a seed, and it behooves him to tend to them until they reach full bloom. Herein lies the realization of the likeness. The very archetype, beginning and end of every virtue, and re are revealed in Christ. The virtues given to human nature at man's creation and developed by his free participation in God's deifying grace appear to exist, then, only by participating in Christ's virtues, as St. Maximus the Confessor teaches. Quote, If the essence of virtue within each man is unquestionably the word of God, since the essence or the reality of all the virtues is our Lord Jesus Christ himself, as it is written, He was made our wisdom, our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. These things clearly being said of him in an absolute manner inasmuch as he is the very wisdom and righteousness and holiness. Then every man who partakes of virtue in steadfast manner partakes of God, the essence of the virtues, beyond any shadow of a doubt, inasmuch as he has of a sincere will cultivated the natural seed of good and made the end identical to the beginning, and the beginning to the end, or rather has shown the real identity of the beginning to the end, in perfect accord with God. For the beginning and end of everything is God's aim. It is the beginning in so far as he joins the natural good to his being by participation. It is the end in so far as according to this participation, by a free-willed decision, he finishes the praiseworthy race leading thither, thanks to which he becomes God as God grants him to become God, because he has joined the likeness constituted by the virtues to the natural good according to the image by his free will, bringing about the return to his beginning and intimacy with God according to the vow of nature. End of quote. The Son of God plays a special and central role in man's creation and deification, God's plan for man is revealed and accomplished in the words as a mystery of Christ. But within the mystery of Christ is revealed and accomplished the mystery 
of Trinitarian economy. Man's creation and deification seem to be the common work of the holy and life-creating Trinity, the work of the Father's benevolent will, which the Son accomplishes hypostatically and by his own operation, and with the cooperation of the Holy Spirit, who quickens, hallows, and brings to perfection. Thus, each divine person of the Holy Trinity makes his own particular contribution to realizing the divine economy, participating and cooperating according to his specific hypostases. But the work of each one is continually linked to that of the other two in accomplishing the common will. To the fathers, man's creation, as also that of the world, seems to have its source in the great pre-eternal council of the holy and consubstantial trinity. The fathers and the whole of the tradition of the church see an expression of the Trinitarian character of man's creation in the plural formula, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Genesis 1, 26. The great Trinitarian council also desired that man become a partaker of the Holy Trinity's eternal and blessed life. Likewise, the fathers affirm that man is created in the image of the Son of God, since, as St. Cyril of Alexandria writes, as we must be called to be sons of God, it is all the more necessary for us to attain the Son's image, so that the imprint of sonship befit us. But in fact, man is created in Christ, in the image of the Holy Trinity. If man is created in the Son's image, writes St. Cyril again, then certainly he is also in God's image in this case, since the characteristics of the whole consubstantial trinity shine in him, because the Godhead is one by nature in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the resplendent glory and the stamp of the Father's nature. The Son makes the Father known by his incarnation, and in Christ man is invited to conform himself to the Father's perfect image, be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be merciful, even as your heavenly Father is merciful. Every gift that man receives, every perfection, every virtue of which he partakes in Christ, has its source in the Father. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Thus Christ in himself unites us to the Father, but he also unites us to the Holy Spirit, since Christ desires to lead us into the very depths of Trinitarian life by calling us to be partakers of the divine nature. And the virtues, also called perfections, graces, energies, through which one effects this participation, are the glory, the light, the grace, the energies, and the perfections, the virtues common to all the persons of the Holy Trinity. For this reason, the fathers are able to attribute them to the Father as their source, to the Son as we who hypostatically manifests them and allows all who have faith in him to partake of them, and to the Holy Spirit inasmuch as he is their bearer and bestower. Sometimes the fathers call these the light or the glory of the fathers, sometimes the grace, light, or glory of the Son, and sometimes the grace of the Holy Spirit. Inasmuch as the Holy Spirit is the bearer and bestower of these graces, virtues, or uncreated energies, he is sometimes called and receives from these the names Spirit of Grace, Spirit of Wisdom, Spirit of Glory, Spirit of Knowledge, Spirit of the Fear of God, Spirit of Truth. The prophet Isaiah in the book of the Revelation even speak of the Spirit in the plural the seven spirits of God, which according to the fathers signify the Holy Spirit's energies or graces. That is why one can likewise say, as does St. Macarius the Egyptian, that man was created in the image of the Spirit, an assertion that again links the teachings of St. Irenaeus with that of the first fathers, who see the Holy Spirit in the breath of life breathed into man at his creation. The ascription of the same virtues in man to Christ and to the Holy Spirit reveals that they are energies common to all persons of the Holy Trinity, but furthermore that the Son and Spirit in man's creation and deification cooperate strictly in realizing the Father's will, 
which at the same time is their will. St. Irenaeus says that the Son and the Spirit are the hands of the Father. Thus man and all things have been created by the Son, but in the Spirit. The Father has made everything through the Word in the Spirit, writes St. Athanasius of Alexandria. For where the Word is, there the Spirit is also, and that which the Father makes receives its existence through the Word in the Holy Spirit. According to the Father's will, the Son's work is to give being to creatures, while the Spirit's work is to perfect them. Thus every virtue in man receives its existence from the Son, but is quickened, hallowed, and perfected by the Holy Spirit in the name of the Father. In this way, the image and likeness in man is willed by the Father, realized by the Son, and fulfilled and brought to perfection by the Holy Spirit. Christ permits the man who turns to him to receive the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit unites man to Christ, and through him to the Father. The Spirit communicates the fullness of divinity to each member of the body of Christ. Through him, man realizes in Christ the likeness of God, since through him is every gift and every virtue is imparted and fulfilled. As St. Basil says, He is the source of sanctification. It is he who shows the believer the image of the invisible one. And in the blessed contemplation of the image, the archetype's inexpressible beauty. Through him, those making progress become perfect. He deifies man, making him conformable to Christ and in him to the Father. He is our perfection, says St. Gregory of Nazazim. So it is only in the spirit that man can realize his nature's archetype, that is to say, be assimilated to Christ. In order that Christ live in him, the spirit must live in him. He must become a spirit bearer. Acquiring the likeness of Christ and acquiring the Holy Spirit go hand in hand in, and condition one another. By living in Christ, the Christian receives the Spirit sent by the Father in the name of the Son. And by living in the Spirit, he unites himself to Christ through participation in Christ's virtues, the Spirit's gifts. In order that man attain his being's perfection in Christ, that he wholly realize his nature, whose standard beginning and end is Christ, and in so doing find his salvation, his real life, and complete health. For all this, he must thus live according to the Spirit and lead a spiritual existence. Man was made spirit, soul, and body so that he might receive the Spirit and thus become completely spiritualized and live with his whole being in the Spirit. Only by accomplishing this task does man fulfill his destiny and live conformably to his real nature. The true man who is in us is the spiritual man, writes Clement of Alexandria. Man is not fully man and does not live in reality unless he lives in the spirit. Otherwise, he is an incomplete, imperfect man and his whole being is as dead. St. Irenaeus affirms this with particular clarity. Quote, the Apostle says, But we speak wisdom among the perfect. By the term perfect, he is indicating those who have received the Spirit of God. The Apostle likewise calls these men spiritual. Being spiritual, they are so by a participation of the Spirit. When the Spirit, in mixing with the soul, is united to the formed work, then, by the grace of this effusion of the Spirit, the spiritual and perfect man is realized. And it is this very man who has been made in the image and likeness of God. When, on the contrary, the soul lacks the Spirit, such a man remaining in all truth, natural and fleshly, will be imperfect, possessing indeed the image of God in the formed work, but not having received by means of the Spirit the likeness. For the flesh, patterned only after itself, is not perfect man. It is only man's body, and so a part of man. Furthermore, the soul by itself is not man, for it is but man's soul, and so a part of man. The spirit also is not man. One gives it the name of spirit, and not that of man. 
It is the mixture and union of all these things that makes up perfect man. And this is why the apostle, explaining himself, clearly defined the perfect and spiritual man, the beneficiary of salvation, when he says in his first epistle to the Thessalonians, May the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 5.23 Thus, they are perfect who simultaneously have the Spirit always abiding abiding with them and keep themselves without reproach as to their souls and bodies. That is, they preserve the faith toward God and guard justice toward their neighbor. Those who possess the promise of the Spirit and who, far from enthralling themselves to the lusts of the flesh, submit themselves to the Spirit and live in everything according to reason, these the Apostle rightly calls spiritual, since the Spirit of God lives in them. End of quote from St. Irenaeus Against Heresies. To continue. And it is our hypostasis, that is, the composition of soul and body, which in receiving the Spirit of God constitutes the spiritual man. Three things make up the perfect man, the flesh, the soul, and the spirit. Those who fear God, who believe in the coming of his Son, and who through faith permanently establish the Spirit of God in their hearts, will rightly be called pure and spiritual men, living for God because they have the Spirit of the Father which purifies man and raises him to God's life. And it is from these two things that living man is made, living thanks to the Spirit's participation, and man by the flesh's substance. Thus, without the Spirit of God, the flesh is dead, deprived of life, incapable of inheriting the kingdom of God. But where the Father's Spirit is, there also is living man, the flesh, possessed of an inheritance by the Spirit, forgets what is, what it is so as to acquire the Spirit's quality and comes into conformity with God's word. Just as St. Gregory Palamas affirmed that the soul's health and perfection is assimilation to Christ, St. Simeon the New Theologian can say from another point of view, which goes hand in hand with the preceding, that health for the soul is the Spirit's coming into it and abiding in it. When he comes, since he drives out every illness and infirmity in the soul, he is called health, for he grants us health of soul. According to the fathers, man's health, generally speaking, consists in being in all respects in the state corresponding to the enlightenment of his whole being. In other words, being authentic to his true nature. Now, as we've said, his authentic nature in real life is to realize this perfection of his being, willed by God, by conforming himself to Christ through the Spirit. Man's natural and normal life is the life in Christ. And this is why Tertullian speaks of the naturally Christian soul. Man is naturally made to reach out toward God. The soul, writes St. Nicetus Stasatus, has its proper inclination naturally toward, turned to the divine goods, its own propensity being for things immortal. St. Anthony writes in the same vein, to seek God and always to serve him remains a natural pursuit for man. The soul is naturally disposed to knowing and recognizing God. That is its normal state, the mark of its health. As Tertullian affirms, the soul, when it comes to itself, as when rising from stupor or slumber or from some illness, and when it is in its normal state of health, calls God by this name alone, for it is the proper name of the true God. Participation in the Holy Trinity's blessed life is the human life's normal goal and nature. And St. Anthony writes regarding this, The love I have for you makes me entreat God that he bring you to think of the invisible as your inheritance. Assuredly, my sons, this does not surpass our nature, but rather crowns it naturally. Man's normal state is being completely united to God with all his being. Adam was created already realizing this, and Christ comes to remind man who was led astray that the greatest commandment for him if he wishes to recover his true nature 
is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. It thus seems that by turning all his faculties toward God so as to be united through them to him, man makes a normal use of them in conformity with their nature. Indeed, this makes up the virtues in man. Thus writes St. Basil, quote, We have received from God the natural tendency to do what he commands. By using these strengths appropriately, we live healthily in virtue. Consequently, such is the definition of virtue which God demands of us, the conscientious use of these faculties according to the Lord's command. End of quote. In other words, leading a virtuous life consists only of living in accordance with one's own nature, that is, in using one's faculties in the way for which they were made, to direct oneself toward God and to realize his likeness. The identification of the natural state with the virtuous one, Adam's original state, and that of the man restored in Christ is constantly affirmed by the fathers. However, many be the virtues which we put into practice. We put them into practice in accordance with nature, writes Evagrius. Where we abide in nature, there we are in virtue, notes St. John of Damascus. And St. Isaac the Syrian says just as explicitly that virtue is the soul's natural state. St. Dorotheus of Gaza also shows that the virtues allow us to pull ourselves together and come back to the natural state by practicing Christ's holy commandments. And John the Solitary says that when man turns to his soul through the virtues, he remains in the order of his whole nature. Likewise, the fathers affirm that for man, true health corresponds to this state of virtue. Virtue is the soul's natural health, writes St. Dorotheus of Gaza, as do St. Basil the Great, Evagrius, and St. Maximus the Confessor, who writes, What health is for the living body, virtue is with respect to the soul. St. Isaac the Syrian notes similarly, Virtue is naturally the soul's health. One can even say that virtue is even more important for the soul than is health for the body, since, as St. Basil the Great says, the virtues have much more affinity with the soul than does health with the body. Only by practicing the virtues, and in particular their crown, compassion, is man made capable of the knowledge or spiritual contemplation in which the spirit, but also his other faculties, exert themselves in accordance with their nature's goal. For man was created so as to contemplate visible nature and be initiated into the intelligible world, recalls St. Simeon the New Theologian. And Clement of Alexandria, who styles man as a truly heavenly plant, also says that man is born to contemplate the heavens. Only in this activity which is appropriate to him does man's spirit, and through it the entire soul, find the fullness of their health. As health is to the body, so is knowledge to the intellect, notes St. Maximus. Once reasonable nature receives the contemplation concerning it, then also shall all the spirit's power be healthy, writes Evagrius in the same vein, who further considers spiritual knowledge as the soul's health. Similarly, St. Thalassius, the health of the soul is knowledge. This contemplation in its first degree is that of the spiritual intellects of creatures, their logiae, or which the fathers call natural contemplation. Even if this gives man a real knowledge of beings and above all elevates him to being their author, nevertheless, it remains but an indirect knowledge of God. In the knowledge and contemplation, theoria of God himself, which is a gift from God and is accomplished by the Spirit, man attains to the highest degree of perfection to which he is called by nature. Since man is deified in this knowledge, or rather this vision, this theoria of God, which takes place in the light of uncreated grace. End of chapter 1. Chapter 2. 
The first origin of illnesses, the ancestral sin. Though the realization of God's likeness began in the image, it was offered to Adam's free will with the divine commandment as a guide. Nevertheless, by means of his freedom, Adam could follow another path, to abandon the good, to go to the bad in separating himself from God by a deliberate choice. John Damascene. The serpent revealed and proposed this other possibility, which served as a permanent temptation for the first man. The function of this temptation was constantly to test man's will and thus give meaning and value to his choosing God. Without this possibility of committing evil, Adam in fact would not have been completely free, since the path of deification would have been presented as the only one possible and thus necessary and imposed by his nature. God, desiring man to be perfect, endowed him with an absolute liberty that permitted man himself to participate in his deification and to make his own the acquired likeness in God. If the task of accomplishing the realization of the likeness had been given to man without any other possible choice, he could not have really been virtuous. For as St. John Damascene notes, where there is necessity, one cannot be virtuous. The temptation was thus implied by the very fact that man possessed an absolute freedom and by God's will that we receive the recompense of our labor and that the result of our likeness not turn to praising another. It was thus necessary, writes St. John Damascene, that man first be proven. If neither tried nor tested, man is not worth of any consideration. Once tested, notes St. Gregory Nazazine, the soul shall possess the object of its hope as the prize of its virtue, and not solely as a gift from God. All of the fathers insist on the fact that Adam was created entirely good by God. In his natural condition in paradise, man lived wholly in the good. Not only did he commit no evil, but he was even unaware of it, temptation giving him knowledge not of evil itself, but only of the possibility of it, the very knowledge of evil appearing as a result of sin and not as its cause. In paradise, evil existed only in the serpent, the incarnation of Satan, and could not affect creation in any way so long as Adam remained its king. Further, he held no power over the first man, being able to do nothing but tempt him. This temptation remained without consequence so long as man refused to consent to it. The devil would say to Adam and Eve, you will be as gods. And in this lay the temptation. Certainly God destined Adam to become God, but by participation with him, in him, and through him. What the serpent proposed to Adam and Eve was to become as gods, that is to say other gods, independent of God, and to become gods without God. By giving in to the devil's suggestion, Adam thus wished to make himself God, to deify himself. This is what his sin consisted of. This affirmation of absolute autonomy, this will to dispense with God and to take his place or to raise himself up as another God opposite him, constituted a negation, a refusal of God. Adam's participation in the divine life assumed, as we have said, the cooperation of his free will. In turning away from God, he deprived himself of the grace which constituted his nature's true life. God had told Adam and Eve, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Whereas the devil had promised, You will not die. The mendacious character of the devil's promise is revealed in the consequences of sin. Having cut himself off from the source of all life, man falls into death, the death to come of his body, although it had been created potentially incorruptible, and the immediate death of his soul. With sin, writes St. John Damascene, death entered the world like a wild and savage beast, ransacking human life and St. Gregory Palamas, after our ancestors' transgression in paradise, sin came into life. As for us, we are dead, 
And after bodily death, we suffered the soul's death, that is to say, the soul's separation from God. Turning from the root of his being and of all being, man falls into non-being. Bereft of the thought of God and turning toward nothingness, for evil is non-being and good is being, mankind is also deprived of being forever, writes St. Athanasius of Alexandria. For man, every evil falls upon this turning away, since by it he falls from the heavenly good things in which he was already participating, and which he was called by nature to possess in fullness. In fact, it is from God that every good thing has its goodness, and inasmuch as one distances oneself from him, one approaches evil. As St. John Damascene notes, in turning from God and denying him, and ignoring him, man turns from his authentic nature and his true end to become like unto him by the Spirit. He thus perverts all his naturally God-directed faculties and makes deviant the disposition imprinted in his nature. Hence, there follows the worst kinds of disorder in his being, which ceases to be turned toward its normal goal, and for his body and soul, which no longer fulfill their natural condition of union with God. St. Maximus then sums up what this fall of man consists of. Quote, from St. Maximus the Confessor's Ambiguia to John chapter 7, He who distances himself from his own origin, though he finds himself to be a particle of God, by reason of the virtue which is in him according to the purpose which was given him, is led unreasonably to non-being. Rightly is he said to fall, because he does not act according to his cause and origin, according to which, in which and through which he came into being. His balance is unstable, and he finds himself in frightful confusion of soul and body. He makes himself into the author of his own fall, from the inherent and self-same purpose towards that which is worst by a, devi a deviation to which he consents. Consequently, he is said to fall from on high, since having the power to direct the steps of his soul irresistibly toward God, he has voluntarily exchanged that which is best and being for that which is worst and non-being, end quote. To continue, it is always in relation to man's essential nature, to his theanthropic obligation of being, that the fathers define evil and sin. Every act which turns man from God and his becoming divine, the defecation to which he is called by nature, is evil and constitutes a sin. In other words, every act by which man turns his faculties away from their natural goal. To do evil, writes Dionysius the Areopagite, is to depart from the good way, to contradict one's true intention, one's nature, one's purpose, one's origin, one's goal, one's definition, one's will, finally one's very essence. Evil is found not in the essence of creatures, but in their false and irrational movement, writes St. Maximus for his part. He notes further, quote, one could say that evil is nothing but the failure to direct to their end the faculties placed in human nature. What is more evil is an irrational movement of the natural faculties, leading them according to an erroneous judgment to something other than their true end. I understand by end the author of all creation toward whom all beings strive in virtue of their very nature. End of quote. Maximus questions to Thalassius. To continue, in turning man away from God, sin puts his faculties in a state contrary to nature and deprives his whole being of being and good. Evil consists for man in this state. Evil is nothing other than the deprivation of good and the path which goes away from that which is according to nature to that which is contrary, writes St. John Damascene in the exact exposition of the Orthodox faith, volume four, to continue. Everything that God has made is very good. Everything that remains as he created is very good. That which voluntarily separates itself from the natural and goes to what is contrary to nature becomes bad. Everything that serves and obeys the creator is according to nature, 
When a creature voluntarily revolts and disobeys its creator, it makes a foundation for evil within itself. For vice is the voluntary deviation from what accords with nature to what is contrary thereto. This is sin. To say that man puts himself in a state contrary to nature by sin is to say that in turning from God he turns away from himself. He lives be beside what he is fundamentally, not leading the life for which he was made and thinking and acting in a way which is in strangely contrary to his true condition. In other words, man lives then in a state of alienation. Though we were by nature the property of the omnipotent God, writes St. Irenaeus, apostasy has alienated us contrary to nature. End of quote. St. Macarius the Great observes the same state of alienation, although expressing himself in a different fashion. Ever since Adam transgressed the commandment, there is something like a second soul beside the soul. End of quote. St. Athanasius as well notes that the soul forgetting in its sin that it is in the image of God and no longer seeing the word in whose likeness it was made departs from itself. By turning away from God, man deprives himself of the divine condition which was promised to him, and as Clement of Alexandria quite strikingly says, allows himself to be hurled into the condition of man. He even falls into a subhuman state, since as we have seen, true humanity exists only in divino humanity. Man cannot truly be man except in God, in being man-God in the spirit and the likeness of Christ. The fathers often compare the condition of fallen man to that of the animals. St. Gregory of Nyssa says, for example, man, having laid aside the divine form, has become a savage beast in the image of animal nature. And St. Maximus notes that man is compared to the senseless cattle, seeking desiring and acting in every way like they, and even surpassing them in insanity, having exchanged his natural reason according to nature for that which is contrary to nature. The man who has turned his spirit away from God finds himself deprived of divine life. He withdraws, enters into a state of torpor and darkness, and becomes as though dead. Man thus reaches the point of losing any notion of his spiritual function amputated of this function which comprises his being's essential dimension and by which he gave light, life, sense, and cohesion to all his faculties, and additionally allowing him to grow in God, man is suddenly reduced to a minuscule part of himself. He only has command of a very meager portion of his possibilities. Of the total man that he was, spiritual, natural, corporal, man is now only natural and corporal. In the very structure of his being and the ordering of his faculties, he ceases to be an integral man, so as to be nothing but a hundredth or a thousandth, thousandth of a man, a comparison which gives an idea but which in fact makes no sense, for in truth man exchanges infinity to take on the very limited condition of fallen man. In any case, man becomes incomplete. St. Irenaeus remarks, quote, When the spirit is lacking from the soul, such a man remaining in all truth natural and carnal will be imperfect, end quote, against heresies. Henceforth, man lives in a reduced, confined, and even apparently closed world, leading an existence withdrawn to the dimension of his fallen being. His soul and body die spiritually, ceasing to receive their true life, namely, the divine life communicated them by the Holy Spirit. St. Irenaeus writes further on this subject. From Against Heresies, Volume 5, quote, Three things make up the perfect man, the flesh, the soul, and the spirit. One of these saves and forms, to wit the spirit. Those who do not have the element that saves and forms with life in mind will justly be called flesh and blood, since... They do not have the Spirit of God in them. Moreover, this is why they are called dead by the Lord. Leave the dead to bury their own dead. Luke 9.60 For they do not have the Spirit which quickens man. End of quote. 
to continue Dr. Larchet coming from another point of view, St. Gregory Palamas arrives at the same conclusion regarding this consequence of sin. Quote, when the soul leaves the body and is separated from it, the body dies. Likewise, when God leaves the soul and is separated from her, the soul dies. Thus, fallen man lives in truth as one dead and is living dead, although he believes that he lives and even thinks sometimes that he, he lives intensely. St. Simeon, the theolo new theologian, describes in the following manner how this condition of fallen men appears to one endowed with spiritual discernment, although those subject to it are unconscious of it. To quote from St. Simeon's hymns, hymn number four, 44. The dead among themselves can neither see one another nor complain to each other. Those who live groan in seeing them, for they behold a strange wonder, men stricken with death, who live, yea, who walk, blind men who think they see, and truly deaf who imagine they hear. They live, see, and hear as animals do. They think like the insane in their unconscious consciousness, in their cadaverous life. For it is possible to live without living, to see without seeing, and to hear without hearing." End of quote. By his sin, man devotes himself to all kinds of evils, woes, and misfortunes that do not pertain in essence to his nature and which did not affect him as long as he lived in conformity with it, but only appear as the results of his error and constitute his chastisement. This chastisement consists mainly in the loss of spiritual center of his being. The dislocation of his soul, see St. Macarius of Egypt's homilies, on the dislocation of the soul, the loss of his initial powers, the disruption, the perversion, the deterioration of all his faculties, and in the state of sickness and suffering which this institutes. God in no way inflicts this chastisement. Rather, it follows naturally and necessarily from the fall. And when God announces to Adam and Eve the evils which will result from their transgression, he does not pr produce them but only predicts and describes them. Man, notes the psalmist, makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole which he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own pate is violence descends. St. Maximus writes, Nature punishes those who seek to assault her to the degree to which they deliver themselves up to a way of living contrary to nature. They no longer have at their disposal all the powers of nature that she herself had given them. Behold, they are diminished in their integrity and thus chastised. By sin, notes St. Maximus further, human nature wages war implacably against itself. And from many viewpoints, one can say that this is equivalent to real suicide for man. That man should cause such serious harm to his nature and thus act against his most fundamental interests so far as to be cut off from himself and to plunge his entire being into pain, non-being and death, turning away from the fullness of life and the perfect bliss which his first condition offered him is all evidence of madness, as the fathers note. St. Dorotheus of Gaza thus writes, quote, Why are we fallen into this poverty? Is it not because of our madness? Why this? Was not man created in the fullness of well-being, of joy, of repose, of glory? Was he not in paradise? It was prescribed to him not to do this. Do not do this. And he did it. Man is mad, says God. He knows not how to be happy. End of quote. To continue, if the fathers thus consider sin itself as an act of madness, they equally consider the state of sin in which fallen humanity lived as a state of madness. In this they follow the Holy Scriptures, and notably St. Paul who writes on the subject of those who remain distance from God, quote, they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, Romans 1, 21-22. 
Even more often, the fathers use medical categories to designate the ancestral sin and its consequences. The sin, they affirm, constitutes a very serious illness affecting man's whole being and depriving him of his original health. St. Gregory of Nyssa, after recalling that, quote, the human race once enjoyed health, evokes the moment of the fall and notes, thenceforth, this deadly illness which is sin took hold of human nature. St. Nicholas Cabasilus writes in the same sense, the day when Adam, giving himself over to the evil spirit, turned away from his good master, his soul, lost its health and well-being. Since then, the body also has gone hand in hand with the soul and has suffered the same fate. It has degenerated with it. St. Cyril of Alexandria expresses himself in a similar manner. Nature fell ill with sin by the disobedience of a single man. In Adam, man's nature fell ill with corruption. As we shall presently see, this illness and degeneration consists essentially in this, that all man's faculties which were made to be directed toward God and to unite man to him have turned away from this their natural goal by sin and work henceforth against nature, moving and drifting in the direction away from their true end, and thus acting in a disordered, irrational, absurd, insane, mad manner. When God withdraws, writes St. John Chrysostom, everything is turned upside down. See St. John Chrysostom homilies on the epistle to the Romans, chapter 4. And St. Gregory of Nyssa explicitly affirms that by using his soul's faculties contrary to nature, man is, that is, extravagant, absurd, and insane. And that is, of another nature, strange and foreign. One can go so far as to translate this word as alienated to a degree beyond anyone's power to express, he writes in his letters on virginity. St. Gregory Nyssa concludes, quote, If we could imagine anyone putting his armor on all the wrong way, reversing the helmet so as to cover his face, while the plume nodded backward, putting his feet into the cuirass and fitting the greaves onto his breast, changing to the right side all that ought to be on the left, and vice versa, and how such a hoplite would be likely to fare in battle. Then we should have an idea of the fate in life which is sure to await him whose confused judgment makes him reverse the proper uses of his soul's faculties. End of chapter 2. Chapter 3. Pathology of Fallen Man. 1. Pathology of Knowledge. A. Perversion and Decline of Knowledge and Its Organs. The fathers note that the knowledge and organs of fallen man are ill. How could one speak of health for the rational soul when the latter is ill in its faculty of knowledge? Asks St. Gregory Palamas. This illness basically consists of the ignorance of God. Adam, says St. Maximus, was ill with the ignorance of his own cause. Indeed, he remarks, what health and illness are to the living body, knowledge and ignorance are that in relation to the spirit. Evagrius likewise considers the ignorance of God as the most basic illness of the soul, whereas on the contrary, knowledge is the health of the soul. Man's intellect is made by nature to seek out things divine and to aim at the knowledge of God. It is healthy when it performs this activity befitting its nature. In turning away from God, the noose or intellect becomes sick, since it ceases to have an acti any activity conforming to its natural aim in order to exercise itself contrary to nature. This is why St. Maximus makes clear the wrong use of the rational faculty is ignorance and folly. Although the human soul was made to see God and be illumined by him, it has in fact perverted itself and turned away from God and spiritual realities by sin in order to turn to sensible realities, and to regard nothing but them. However, in man's case, sin does not consist of considering sensible realities. 
God endowed man with an intellect, not only so that he might strive for knowledge of him, but also that he might know the intelligible and sensible creatures. Adam knew them before his fall, yet his knowledge was from a spiritual point of view. He naturally contemplated what the fathers call their spiritual reasons. In other words, he grasped them in their relation to their creator and knew them as having their beginning and end in him. He saw them completely in God, as having from him their being and their qualities, seeing God present in them through his energies. For as St. Maximus underlines, the entire world appears mysteriously imprinted in the sensible, in symbolic forms for those who can see, and the entire sensible world is contained in knowable manner in the intelligible and simplified by the intellect in the Logoi. The world is in the intellect through the world's Logoi, and the Logoi are in the intellect through their impressions. And their reality is as though a wheel were inside a wheel. Following the expression used by the great and wonderful seer Ezekiel, speaking, it seems to me, of the two worlds, its visible perfections are seen from creation, thanks to the works showing them to the intellect. Thus speaks the divine apostle. And if things are completely are contemplated by means of visible as it, as it is written, all the more reason shall those who apply themselves to spiritual contemplation have the intellect of that which appears by means of the invisible things. For the symbolic vision of intelligible things by means of the visible is spiritual science, and intellectualization of visible things by means of invisible ones. Adam, says St. Maximus, was even destined to, end, to the end of his spiritual growth to consider creatures from God's own point of view, to acquire knowledge and information of them similar to that of God. For thanks to the deification of his intellect and the transmutation of his senses, man would no longer have been simply man but a god. Man could thus have said, along with the wise Solomon, quote, For it is he who gave me unerring knowledge of what exists, to know the structure of the world and the activity of the elements, the beginning and end and middle of times, the natures of animals, the powers of spirits and the reasonings of men, the varieties of plants and the virtues of roots. I learned both what is secret and what is manifest, for wisdom, the fashioner of all things, taught me. To continue, for Adam and those who have become his imitators, sin and evil at this level consisted in ignoring God and in considering beings independently of him, no longer understanding them spiritually in the intelligible reality expressed in them, according to the divine energies revealed in them, but carnally in their sensible appearance alone. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil of which the book of Genesis speaks and which God forbade Adam to touch under penalty of death represents the visible creation, according to St. Maximus. Quote, Contemplated spiritually, it is the tree of good, considered in its material aspect, that of the knowledge of evil. Indeed, it becomes a master who teaches the passions and leads to forgetfulness of God, those who only have bodily relations with it. End of quote. In forbidding man to eat of the fruit of the tree, God had indicated to him the danger present in entering into this second form of knowledge of which hitherto man was ignorant. First, he had to grow in the knowledge of his creator, and only after this could he delight without harm in the visible creation. But Adam preempted this process, and by reason of his infantile state, showed himself incapable of taking on the task spiritually and fell into sin. Through sin, Adam's spiritual eyes were closed, and in their place were opened the eyes of his flesh. Indeed, notes Origen, there are two kinds of eyes. One kind was opened by sin, the other served Adam and Eve in seeing before the former were opened. Scripture says, then the eyes of both were opened. 
Genesis 3-7, thereby evoking their carnal eyes, that is, the carnal way of seeing reality. Adam and Eve thus beheld each other naked, the text continues, and St. Athanasios gives the following commentary. They knew they were naked because they were divested of the contemplation of God and had their thought turned in the opposite direction. St. Simeon likewise makes note of this diversion of man's primordial knowledge and his decline. Quote, in place of spiritual and divine knowledge, man received carnal knowledge. Yea, he began to see with the eyes of the body, the eyes of his soul being blinded, fallen from imperishable life. Let us observe that the opening of the eyes of the flesh does not provoke the closing of the spiritual eyes. Rather, the converse is true. Through ignorance of God, the knowledge according to God ceases to exist, and the knowledge according to the flesh takes its place. St. Maximus elaborates, quote, Evil is ignorance and of the beneficent author of creatures. It is this ignorance that has, on the one hand, diminished the spirit, and on the other hand, opened wide the road to the senses, completely distancing man from divine knowledge, in order to fill his existence with nothing but the passionate knowledge of sensible things. End of quote. St. Simon the New Theologian likewise affirms, if he had not first fallen from the knowledge and contemplation and theoria of God, he would not have descended to that other knowledge. One can explain this by the fact that the intellect, ceasing to know God and in general spiritual or intelligible realities, nevertheless remains bound to know something, since it continues to be in movement according to the demands of its nature. Since then, it takes as its object sensible realities, more precisely beings considered exclusively in their sensible appearance, which are from now on the only things the intellect can perceive, since this has denied, refused, or forgotten everything else, as St. Maximus shows, quote, Every human intellect that is lost and drifts away from its natural movement no longer has any movement but for the passions, the senses, and sensible things, since it no longer has anywhere else to be once the movement that naturally goes toward God is lacking. End of quote. While man's cognitive faculties in their original state received their light, from the spirit and thus had knowledge according to their nature and even the natures of beings turning away from god they henceforth subordinate themselves to the senses and receive all information from them having become a transgressor and one ignorant of god man linked all his intellectual power to sensation writes saint simeon the new theologian thus since then is man's intellect and noose enslaved to this world The intellect allows itself to be guided not only by sensation, but also by all the passionate desires that appear in the soul as an effect of ignorance, which is the cause of all vices, according to St. Mark the ascetic, along with forgetfulness of and disregard for God. These three negative attitudes that are indivisible and mutually supportive are considered by St. Mark the ascetic and following him by St. John Damascene as the three powerful giants of the devil, the most profound and interior passions in the soul, through which the rest of the passions of wickedness act by being insinuated, living and finding their strength in souls. Human knowledge thus finds itself in a state of sin, given over to the passions, determined by them from beginning to end. Truly, these passions captivate the noose. As a result of the disregard for and ignorance and forgetfulness of God, as well as its submission to all the other passions, the noose is darkened, becomes blind, becomes lost, plunges the soul into obscurity, and moves the whole of man into a world of darkness. Wholly absorbed by sensation, the noose moreover becomes heavy and thick. It becomes incapable in any way of a just discernment and of true knowledge. St. John Chrysostom remarks, Just as those who are in darkness are unaware of the nature of things, so too 
do those who live in sin not distinguish between things? They run towards shadows as towards reality. St. Isaac, the Syrian in turn, emphasizes that the passions destroy the noose's natural health to such a degree that they render it incapable of any spiritual knowledge. Just as the bodily sense when it is harmed for one reason or another is deprived of vision, so too does knowledge not act in the noose, which is in the nature, if it is not healthy. St. Simeon, the New Theologian, also exclaims, Those which are visible things, O oh my God, I cannot say. We, are, we all are fallen into vanity, incapable of true judgment of beings. Having allowed himself to be taken in by worldly knowledge, man cannot escape from the snares of error. And he has sick thoughts, notes St. Isaac. From that time on, man has possessed a knowledge closer to that of animals than that of a true man, because he committed a wrong against the word, the logos. Man is quite naturally considered to be deprived of logos, that is, of reason, and compared with the beasts, writes Clement of Alexandria. And St. Nikitas de Sathos says in like manner of fallen man, he is moved contrary to nature and not rationally. He lives in opposition to reason, enslaved to sensations, in opposition to his dignity. For having lost the natural activity of his noose, he is likened unto beings without reason by this behavior. For reason is dead in him, and the least rational part of the soul has borne it away through this behavior. Ceasing to see God in beings and beings in God, man loses the notion of their common beginning and end, he ceases to grasp them in their fundamental unity. Rather, he gains from them a fragmented, divided, composite knowledge. And if he does, not, and if he does strive to reunify his knowledge, he can only do it through devices manufactured by his reason, which no longer be, being spiritually informed has indeed no other recourse but to base its exercise or arbitrary principles that it defines itself or on sensible in, 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 intuitions which no longer present any objective character to the extent that they are relative to fallen man's distorted perception. The alienation of the noose in sensation corresponds to the lowest degree of the mind's fall outside the knowledge of God and natural contemplation. Its spread throughout the rational activity that has become autonomous, is an intermediary stage, but one that for man also constitutes a type of alienation of his intellect or alienation of his noose. More and more often, fallen man knows only the ra rational use of his noose and can go as far as considering this the only authentic, indeed even possible, mode of knowledge. Giving himself over to this man thus comes to know what the fathers call the captivity of thoughts, which can proceed from the most empirical and unorganized forms of thought to the most elaborate constructs of abstract thinking. By investing itself in sensation, but also in the reason's activity that deploys an aut autonomous thought of abstract nature, the intellect or nous turns itself outward. It not only separates man from God, but also man from himself. This is what the fathers refer to as the separation of the mind and the heart. In its natural state, the intellect, the noose, is united with the heart, which in scriptural and patristic terminology designates the interior man, man's ontological center and the root of all his faculties. When it performs the contemplative activity, corresponding to its nature, the mind goes in circular motion. It remains in the interior of the heart and does not spread out beyond, but goes into itself and by itself is raised to God. Abandoning its contemplative activity, the noose and intellect no longer moving circularly, but in a straight line, 
leaves the heart and thus man's spiritual center spreading out to the exterior in a discursive activity in which it is dispersed and divided and which renders man simultaneously exterior to himself and to God. When it is in this state, the noose intellect is in a state of constant distraction, never ceasing to wander and ramble and rove about to and fro, and knowing a permanent state of agitation in contrast to the state of profound calm, which characterized its contemplative activity. Its thoughts, previously focused and united, spread themselves abroad and spill out, now manifold and diverse, in a never-ending flow. They become muddled and unstable, are divided and dispersed, finding an escape on every side and enslaving and partitioning the whole of man amongst themselves. St. Maximus can thus call to mind the scattering of the soul in exterior forms and the semblance of sensible things. Since the soul becomes complex in the image of a sensible multiplicity, which it paradoxically has created for itself, and which in fact is nothing but an illusion proceeding from its being made unable to perceive the objective unity of beings by its ignorance of them in the energies of the one God. From the separation of the mind and the heart, a true spiritual schizophrenia in the etymological sense of the word, since it divides man's heart, follows the division of the entire soul. Following the intellect in the noose, which is dispersed and divided in the multiplicity of the thoughts it produces and the sensations that follow it, all of the faculties beset and moreover enlivened by the multiplicity of the passions, exert themselves in many and oft times divergent directions, which turn man into a being divided on all levels. One sees that the ignorance of God reveals itself in the form of a multitude of pathological effects which bear on man the fundamental importance that the knowledge of God once did. So that St. Mark the ascetic considers ignorance of God to be the mother and nurse of all evils. St. Nikitas Stathatos thus sums up some of its effects. Quote, Ignorance is a calamity and more than a calamity. It is truly a palpable darkness. It darkens the souls in which it is found. It divides thought at the core and hinders the soul from uniting itself to God. Everything that is joined to it is disorder and irrationality, for it, ignorance, renders man completely irrational and insensitive. When ignorance spreads out and deepens, it becomes an infernal abyss for the soul subjected to it, in which are all torments, all pains, all sorrows, and all moans. Pathology of Knowledge continued be evil as an invention, the birth of fantastical knowledge, the delirious perception of reality in fallen man. Evil does not come from God and is not in God and did not exist in the beginning. God did not create evil. All beings were entirely good in the beginning and lived completely in the good. As we have seen, Adam was free from all evil in the beginning. To be sure, evil was present in paradise in the person of the serpent, the devil, but this evil affected neither man nor creation. God had created the devil himself good, but by his own free will, he fell from his first condition of archangel and became wicked. Evil, say the fathers, is an invention. Firstly, an invention of the devil of his freedom, and secondly, of man who was seduced by Satan to follow the same path as he, that is to turn in like manner away from God. St. Gregory of Nyssa writes, quote, So he was a free agent, though circumvented with cunning when he drew upon himself that disaster which now overwhelms humanity. He became himself the discoverer of evil. 
but he did not therein discover what God had made. Man became, in fact, himself the fabricator to a certain extent and the craftsman of evil. Evil is thus a creation not of gods, but of the devil and of man who collaborates with him. It is a product of the diabolical and human wills which could never have existed had the devil not turned away from God and which would have been limited to his personal loan and those of the other fallen angels had man not consented to follow him. Evil existed from the beginning as a possibility of human freedom. This was essential in order that this liberty would be really perfect. If man could not have committed evil, he would not have been totally free. Yet this freedom has as a condition the mere possibility of evil, not the actualization of this possibility, not the effective accomplishing of evil. As we shall show in the following, evil on the contrary could do nothing but cause freedom to fall from its original perfection. Evil is not only an invention, it is a fantastical invention. Evil, writes St. Athanasius, is only a fiction of the human intellect. Indeed, the fathers strongly insist that evil has no substance and is pure non-being. This does not mean that evil does not exist in any way, but that it only has a negative existence. Evil is non-being such that it is, as we have seen, the ignorance, negation, refusal, and forgetfulness of God, who is very being, the source of all being and the true being of everything. St. Athanasius also writes, Deprived of the thought of God, men have become forever deprived of being. Turning from God, man inevitably conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and brings forth lies. For man, by ignoring God, acquires a knowledge of things that no longer corresponds to the true being of things, a knowledge which may be considered to be a fiction, a figment of man's imagination, a phantasm. In refusing to think on the good, writes St. Athanasios further, men began to imagine and conceive of things that do not exist. Man living outside of God, who is the only being that truly and absolutely exists, as he reveals to Moses, I am who I am, can know only nothingness now, having turned away from the good and forgetting that it is in the image of the good God, the power that is in the soul no longer sees God, the word in whose likeness it was made, going out of itself, it thinks and imagines only nothingness. Indeed, no longer perceiving in himself the image of God, which is his fundamental constitution, nor the spiritual reasons of creatures. Man perceives an empty reality. He has knowledge of himself and other beings outside of God and thus knows them as nothingness. Looking on creation as if God were absent from it, although he is everywhere present and fills all things, man is delirious and he evinces his madness. He who says in his heart, there is no God, is a fool, says the psalmist, although ever since the creation of the world, God's invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. Romans 1.20 Man is ignorant of all, even though he thinks to have knowledge. Having closed his spiritual eyes and holding as realities the nothingness which is henceforth offered as knowledge to his darkened noose. St. Athanasios writes, quote, from against the pagans, an analogous comparison in Gregory of Nyssa on virginity. When the sun shines and illumines the whole earth with its light, if a man were to close his eyes and think to himself that he were in darkness, whereas the darkness does not exist, and then would walk about ha haphazardly as if he roamed in darkness, unceasingly falling and de departing into chasms, he would think that it were not daylight, but rather that he were in the darkness. He would believe that he was looking, but would not see anything at all. In like manner, the human soul has conceived evil, and moving toward it, believes it does something, whilst 
doing nothing, closing its eyes, permitting it to see God, for it is nothingness that it imagines. It has not remained such as it was created, but is shown to be as if it has shaped itself, for it was made to see God and be illumined by him, but in God's stead it is soft after, sought after corruptible things and shadows. End of quote. Man's knowledge becomes delirious in yet another way through sin. Turning from God, man comes to consider creatures in and of themselves, independently of their creator, since he believes that the universe exists by itself. This way of knowing is nothing but imagination, illusion, delirium. Everything that exists exists by God and for God. Every being derives its sense, value, and very reality from God, the beginning and end, the alpha and omega of every creature. Every being is essentially related to God, and understanding it outside of this relation is not to know it as it really is, but as it is not. The world that man perceives outside of God is nothing but a phantasm, a fiction, and the product of a certain type of delirium. This is why St. Athanasius writes in this regard of those who consider works without considering him who made them, quote, Fools and blind men, how could they even know of a building, a ship, a liar, if there were not a carpenter to construct the ship, an architect to build the building, a performer to make the liar? He who would think thus would be a fool beyond all folly. In like manner, I do not think that those who do not recognize God, who do not worship the Word, the Savior of, our, of all, our Lord Jesus Christ, who by the Father orders all things, contains all, and provides for all, have a healthy mind. End of quote. Having lost the sense of beings, relationship to God, and thus of their relative character, man inevitably turns them into absolutes. And these latter occupy in his mind the place of God, whom he has denied. Thus, fallen man replaces the worship of the creature, the creator with the worship of creatures. Idolatry exists not only in the often taken form forms of organized religion in which creatures are explicitly defined as gods, but also in all man's attitude vis-a-vis -vis a being, when this being is taken as an end and is endowed with a sense and value per se, instead of these latter being recognized in God. Idolatry also exists in every activity and effort consecrated upon a being per se, instead of being consecrated to God through it. One holds an idolatrous attitude towards a being whenever this being stops being transparent to God, stops revealing him. In other words, whenever man stops perceiving its spiritual reasons and perceiving in them the divine energies present in them that define its true nature. Thus, this being hides God instead of manifesting him. It is closed in on itself in a way, instead of serving as a stepping stone for man, that he might be raised up to his creator Man then gives to the object itself, reduced to nothingness by his ignorance, the honor he should have given by it as an intermediary to God. St. Paul considers the attitude of man acting thus as a manifestation of madness. Quote, they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man or birds or animals or reptiles, Romans 1, 21 and following. Following after the Holy Apostle, the fathers are unanimous in seeing a form of spiritual madness in idolatry. Thus, St. Athanasios writes, quote, Men, in their madness, mistook the gift that they had been created for them, turned away from God, and so tainted their soul that they not only forget the idea of God, but also forged for themselves other gods in his place. They made for themselves idols instead of the truth and preferred nothingness to the true God, worshiping the creature instead of the creator. And Elsewhere, he writes the same. 
Men, having learnt to imagine the evil which does not exist, in the same way made themselves into gods which do not exist, in their madness, forgetting the thought and knowledge of God, and having only a blinded reason, or rather unreason, made gods for themselves of visible things, glorifying the creatures instead of the Creator, and deifying the works rather than the Master, God, and the cause and of all. Further on he notes, Whereas nothing exists outside of the Logos, but the heavens and the earth and all beings contained in them are dependent on him, nevertheless men in their madness rejected the knowledge of and piety towards him, and honored that which is not instead of that which is, and instead of God who really is, they deified nothingness, worshipping the creature instead of the creator, and that is folly. To continue, in worshipping creatures instead of the creator, men have traded the truth of God for a lie. By ignoring God who is the very truth, the truth of all being, and source of all truth, man deprives himself of every possibility for true knowledge. No longer grasping reality with his mind and the spirit, he sees everything through the deformed filter of sin and the passions, and acquires, as we have said, a false intelligence. Says Origen, quote, The sinners do not see with the eyes of the good king, but with those that are called the sensuous mind, and through which man, although believing to see, is actually blind. Fallen man thus lives in a false, unreal world created by him, in which he is unconscious of the true meaning of beings. No longer perceiving the true relationships that exist between them, this confusion, moreover, is increased by the activity of the devil, the father of lies, who, as St. John Chrysostom notes, troubles our mind so wretchedly and causes our judgment to wander from the true assessment of things. St. John Chrysostom sees herein a form of madness saying on the subject of sinful men, they are really foolish since they have never learnt to know the true nature of things. Fallen man, as we have said, judges things by his knowledge that has become carnal, only according to their sensible appearance, being ignorant of what they are in themselves, in their intelligible essence. It is as though a veil, that is, things as they appear to the senses, lay before his intelligence, hindering it from grasping what is beyond phenomena, and plunging it constantly into delusion. St. Maximus notes, the veil is the delusion produced by the sense which fixes the soul's attention on the superficial appearances of sensible objects and which bars passage to those which are intelligible. From Ambiguity to John. Man taking as the true being that that which appears to him introduces an utter and total confusion into his perception of reality. He takes the false for the true and the true for the false evil for good, and good for evil. See St. Gregory Palamas Triads. He considers to be most real that which is the least real, the appearance, and considers what is most real, the spiritual, intelligible, and divine reality, to be the least real, or even as if non-existent. Thus fallen man has a completely upside-down view of what is real. He knows a backwards world. The clear manifestation of his delirium. St. John Chrysostom writes, quote, They are stupider than asses, since they call uncertain those things which are more visible than what we see with our eyes. And if you do not want to believe that this is clearer, he adds, wishing to place the sinners whom he addresses once again on the path of true knowledge, continues, You must rather believe invisible things than those which you see with your eyes. This seems to be a paradox, but is nonetheless a reality. St. Maximus, as for himself, underscores the role of demonic activity in, the con in this confusion and delusion. Quote, because of the transgression of the commandment, the soul has become the plaything of all the adverse powers. They have, in fact, made it leave its good sense and have numbered its intellect to heavenly things to the point that the soul believes itself to have been so since the beginning.
End of quote. Having lost the true knowledge of reality that he possessed in the spirit, but nonetheless needing knowledge, fallen man ends up replacing this knowledge not by another single knowledge, but by a multitude of forms of knowledge of all sorts, corresponding to the multitude of appearances among which he henceforth moves. St. Mark the ascetic thus notes that its ignorance and forgetfulness of God Quote, cast a pall of terrible and unstable curiosity over the soul, end of quote. But the types of knowledge resulting from this loss are partial, shifting, differing, even opposed to one another, just like the phenomenal realities to which they apply. Man in his substitu- substitutive forms of knowledge is limited to classifying the appearances of things, these appearances that per se have no objectivity since they are defined by the deformed and fallen intellect of their observer. The rational consciousness that seeks to unify knowledge by transcending the vagaries of sensible perception can only do so artificially, as we have said, by virtue of the conventions that it chooses for itself as foundational, and which are thus entirely relative to it. Fallen man's various forms of knowledge are thus nothing more than illusory projections of his fallen consciousness. And even where an objectivity or truth seems to have been attained, such as in scientific knowledge, this objectivity and truth can be reduced as a matter of fact to the temporary agreement of states of consciousness producing the same type of projection and being in accordance with one another in some way in their common state of decline. Moreover, this this projection can vary according to the values these states of consciousness refer to as well as the goals they pursue. Scientific knowledge itself is not neutral, but as St. Gregory Palamas emphasizes, in this matter, the most modern epistemological thinking concurs with him. It is relative to the intention of those who make use of it, appearing according to the thought of those who make use of it, and easily taking the form which is given it by the point of view of those who possess it. It is all the more true that fallen man's forms of knowledge arise not only to fill the intellectual void left by the loss of spiritual knowledge, but also with the aim of satisfying more often than not material needs, the majority of which are defined by the passions themselves. St. Isaac writes, quote, When knowledge follows after the desire of the flesh, it takes to itself wealth, vainglory, finery, and bodily comfort, becomes attached to the rational wisdom that adapts itself to the rule of this world, and never ceases to invent and renew techniques and sciences. It bears all that crowns the body in this visible world. End of quote. Ascetical Homilies, 63. To conclude... Though these different kinds of knowledge can give man the illusion that he truly knows things and can fill the void which he feels, they are of no fundamental usefulness to him, for they in no way serve him to realize his true destiny. In no wise do they contribute to his deification. Carnal knowledge, as St. Isaac says, is called naked knowledge, for it is divested of all concern for God and wears out the intellect by depriving the latter of reason, since the body dominates the intellect. It only cares about this world. Saying nothing of God, this carnal knowledge, furthermore, says nothing essential about man or about the beings of creation of which he has a spiritual charge. This way of knowing, says St. Simeon, the the new theologian, is in reality the ignorance of all that is good.